Welcome to Diving into the CDA Handbook for High School. I'm Sandy Kowalczyk, and I'm Manager of Growth and Business Development for the Council for Professional Recognition. And I'm especially very happy to be here today to interview Dr. Biza. So a special welcome to you. And Dr. Biza, I'm sure our audience would also love to hear a bit about you before we get started. Hello everyone, I'm Bisa Lewis and I am the CDA uh, for high school project consultant in the growth and the business uh, de development department at the Council for Professional Recognition. And so I really enjoy my work in the field uh, because I've had a background in early learning uh, at the high school level, the college level, but I started in the classroom. Not only have I been a teacher, I've also worked with elementary and high school uh, CTE. So I have, in addition to the number of things that I do. I have the honor and pleasure of working with the council again as project consultant, giving additional help nationally to programs who want to implement the high school CTE CDA program. Thank you so much, Dr. Biza. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. So this council live episode is part of our coaching, training, and technical assistance program that was launched last May. For all of those listening today, the program supports the high school CTE community in building the ECE workforce with the implementation of high quality program content and design through the provision of training and technical assistance services. This includes one-on-one -on -one sessions that Dr. Biza provides in her TA Tuesdays. And more on this can be found in our website which is www.cdacouncil.org backslash high-school-pathways. Now, on to our session. Um, as you know, today we're diving into the CDA Handbook for High School, which can also be downloaded on the site I just mentioned. And we're focusing on key questions from the handbook that have come up in many of Dr. Bees' one-on-one technical assistance sessions as well as in recent webinars. So I know our audience is eager for us to dive into the conversation. So let me start with the first question. What best practices do you recommend for quality industry-based ECE instructor recruitment and professional development? I'm so happy with starting with that question, Sandy, because it really does start with the instructor who is working with the students at the high school level and learning about young children in the child care, early care and education industry. And so we know in early childhood, there are like two different spectrums. There's the birth to five or birth to eight, but then you get into the school system. And so there's a lot of different practices that take place. So because the CDA is a credential that is for birth to five-year-olds, it's so important for high schools and school districts who are recruiting instructors to teach the CDA, well, we'll say the early childhood education pathway, and we hope they'll implement the CDA as a, as a credential in that pathway. They need instructors who are qualified, not just who are um, accredited based on their regional accreditation, but also have experiences actually working in the early care and education industry. So again, keyword is industry. So I, I really think it's important that they have their assistant principal or someone who is, whoever is helping to build that pathway in their program to serve on local committees, boards in the community where they are, uh, are about early learning. Your local United Way, uh, United Way nationally has an education division. And oftentimes the local United Ways will have an early learning uh, program where they are implementing or funding a variety of early learning initiatives in your area. So I would connect with your local United Way. I remember serving on the Success by Six Committee uh, and when I was uh, early in my career. I also remember serving on the high school, uh, you guys, listen, your high school CTE program. Hopefully they have any type of committee, advisory committee serve on that. Um, your child care programs that are nearby. And oftentimes child care programs will have the owner or the industry, well, we'll say the corporate, the company may have several different centers and hopefully one or two are near you. And you can serve on whatever different, different types of committees they have and volunteer there. So I would say you need someone who is um, 
already in the industry and those places, the committees, the boards, those are great places to begin your recruiting. And I share one major example here, Sandy. Uh, when I was a dean uh, at the at Albany Technical College, I remember we I was over early childhood education and the general core programs. We had a child development center on our main campus and we opened another on our branch campus about 50 miles away. And as I was recruiting instructors to teach early childhood, in the program, again, they were teaching the adult students. It was very difficult to find professionals who earned a credential in the field of early care and education or early childhood education and had experiences working in the child care um, industry, the child care portion of the industry. So what I did was I hired two of two stellar kindergarten teachers, but I really put money in my Make sure that I use the money, I'd say, in my professional development budget. I targeted training to support their gaps. Infant toddler was a major gap because they, again, worked with kindergartners. There were stellar teachers, of course, like I said, but they needed infant toddler professional development. So at that time, West Ed in California, they were the premier organization offering training. So I sent them each for a week to California, from Georgia to California, flew them out there, and I used my budget to make sure they had West Ed training. Uh, I also made sure they were serving on boards and committees. Our local high school, right in our backyard, literally in our backyard, had an early childhood program for the high school students. We began working with them, and actually I had them go out and teach courses to the high schoolers to support their program. So that's a long answer to your question, but it's so important that when you are recruiting someone to teach early care and education, early childhood education, that pathway in your high school, in your school district, that it is someone who is either is from the industry, knows the industry, or you can quickly uh, support their gaps with professional development. Your local AEYC, I had them serving on that board. So again, a long answer to the question, but a very important answer because it can't be someone who just knows education or is working in the school system. You're gonna have to have someone who learns or knows about the industry. Thank you so much, Dr. Biza. Those tips are really helpful and I'm sure that will help our audience very, very much. So thank you. Um, the next question will ask you to draw from your work over the years as a consultant with school systems around the country in which you guided leaders and ECE instructors on how to implement the CD, CDA in high school CTE programs. So for high schools with on-site childcare programs, what are some of the best practices you recommend for providing opportunities for high school students to earn the 480 hours of work experience with young children? If you are privileged enough to have an early care and education program where you actually serve the young children, a child care program on your campus, wow. You know, that is the pie in the sky for everyone I consult with, Sandy. Everyone wants that. And those who do have a program on site where they actually work with young children, there are two, one thing that's really important, they separate the duties. In terms of there's an early care and education or early childhood education pathway instructor who works with the high school students, but there's a separate position. There is a person, a professional, whether you call him a director or you may call him early childhood instructor two. I've heard that term uh, in chi early childhood instructor one teaches the high school students, early childhood instructor two teaches, uh, works with the young children in the program and actually brings in the high schoolers to support that work, but they also hire staff who are already credentialed. So it's important first to separate those duties. You should not, not, not have the early childhood in education instructor who's teaching the high school students also working with the young children managing that program. That should be two separate uh, positions because they, there are different requirements. And in order to follow all the important regulations, it's gonna be difficult for that one person to handle both jobs. So that's one of the premier uh, pieces of advice that I will offer. And then secondly, I would say, make sure that you have, I want to promote this, have credentialed staff who work with the children. The students are not your primary caregivers. The high school students are not your primary caregivers for the young children in the program. They're in there to support, observe, volunteer, uh, assist the teacher, but they should not be the primary uh, caregivers for the young children. So those are just two quick examples uh, to support you in really making great use of uh, having a childcare center on campus. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, those are great examples and great demonstrations of that. But for high school programs without on-site child care programs, what recommendations can you offer to support them in meeting the 480-hour work experience requirement? Partnership, partnership, partnership. <laughs> It's so important that you find out in your community who has a child care center nearby or centers nearby, because just like you are looking for a place where your students can go, they're looking for, a, for people to come in and support their program. They're looking for teachers. They're always, always, always looking for teachers in our profession, because unfortunately, there's a high turnover in early care and education and, and honestly, education period when it comes to teachers in the classroom. So make sure that you are supporting one, one another. There's a give take relationship. And oftentimes I've seen Sandy where they will, the, the director will make it um, possible for the students to get there. The transportation is really uh, a barrier for the programs who don't have, um, the high school programs who don't have childcare on site. So transportation is huge. So I've seen a couple of things that work. I've seen where uh, the child care center will actually have their driver, their bus driver, van driver to go to transport the students back and forth. I've also seen uh, that, for instance, United Way has a partnership with Lyft, uh, the rideshare company, and they're able to dial a number and they're able to, I think it's 211, they can dial 211 and they can actually get a Lyft ride uh, to work people in, in the community. So I have seen where you can work it out with that partnership where the students can get a ride to the child care center. Of course, there's a lot of, you know, you got to sign a lot of documents, parents have to approve all of that. But those are two examples that I've really seen work. One that worked for me when I was a high school EC instructor is we had a program right across the street, right across the street. And so what we were able to do after some time was manage our schedule where the Students, when they got to the point where they were only doing the practicum component, working with children, that was the last class of the day. And instead of coming to me, they check in and then they will go across the street to do their hours in the child care center and work with the young children there. So just some examples for if you don't have a program on site, you can make this happen. You just need to work together. And again, three, three pieces of advice, partnership, partnership, partnership. Thanks, Dr. Visa. Yeah, partnership is key. And I've heard all these issues with transportation as well. So those tips you gave for that are fantastic. And I'm sure will help a lot, a lot of people. So thank you. Um, so on to our next question. Out of all the programs you've been consulting with to provide coaching in TA for the council, what are some quality examples and model programs that you can share with our audience? Oh, Sandy, I have seen programs who are doing just what I have uh, just mentioned here, and they are doing it well. And it's because of those partnerships. Uh, I love one program. I won't call them my name, uh, but I will say one program is working very well with their technical college. And, and sometimes you all in CTE, the program may be a partnership already with your local technical college, where the technical college instructors or your community college is, uh, is the are the faculty who are offering teaching the courses to your high schoolers. So I've seen a number of examples where the high school may not be uh, paying higher in the EC instructors, but the local community college is. And so the one tip that I love is they have uh, the two pathways and they're actually adding another. The CDA is going to be the third pathway based on a local uh, TA meeting I had with them. So one pathway they already had was the students could graduate with, uh, you know, just complete the pathway, if you will. Uh, and they complete the pathway, they get a certification or a seal on their diploma. Uh, there's another piece where they complete a health and safety component, where they're just taking the uh, health and safety courses, including uh, first aid CPR, and they're able to get, um, again, this is type of certification as well in their state. So there are two things they could do. They could take the whole pathway or they could simply uh, take the first component, which may be a semester or so, or, or up to a year. And there are two ways. So they don't have to go through the whole program. Most CTE programs to finish a pathway, they are two or three full years. So again, they know everyone may not want to do the entire two or three years. And in some states, there are four years to complete the pathway. So they have a shorter version of the program. I really love that. And because it's in partnership with the local community college, they get college credit. 
And of course, we don't want students to stop at the CDA. It's the first step. We call it the best first step, right? So because it's the best first step, it's so important for the partnerships to happen so students can get credit and not have to start all the way over. So Sandy, for years, I've seen professionals who were earning credential at their local uh, high school college, and they would have to start all the way over when they want to go to the next level in credentialing. So when you partner, they're able to earn credits along the way, and then they can take two, three, four more classes another year and continu continuously uh, earn credentials in the profession. I often talk about my stellar student, Lakeisha uh, McClendon, who is on on the CDA Advisory Council. She's earned five credentials in early childhood education, started with the CDA, and now she's earning her master's for six because, again, those credits were able to, to count in the pathway. So that's one of the examples. Uh, and I'll share one more. At the high school level, when your advisory committees are working, when your partnerships are working, I have seen it where the all of the credits that the the local chakra center that their teachers have access to in professional development, the students get to go, Sandy. So when they have first aid and CPR training, they invite the high school students to come. They often transport them there. Uh, sometimes they'll have people come to the high school, but already the high school students have access to all the industry professional development that the current teachers have. So the local program, again, they own uh, one program I can think of. It's, it's in Easter Seals. And they own a number of chakra centers and they partner with local high schools and they invite their certain partners out to take advantage of the training that they're already receiving. So this way, the high schoolers see their early childhood is bigger than just the classroom. It's so much bigger and they get a chance to already be out there working in professions. And because the program knows them, when they graduate with their CDA credential, they can be a lead teacher in many states. Who do you think is going to hire them? The people who already know them because they already have that partnership in the business and industry. So quick summary, a uh, great partnership when you work with your local community colleges and they can earn credits, uh, college credits. And then another great partnership when you partner with business and industry and they can take advantage of the industry professional development and they already have an employer who's interested in hiring them when they graduate. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. I mean, especially those two examples. And I think it will ease people's minds to knowing with the partnerships and working with communities, they can have hopefully a, a job soon afterwards as well. And it's it's good to know about the timeline too. Um, so what, what do you think some of the greatest challenges are uh, aside from those that you've already mentioned? And then how do you recommend programs overcome those challenges? One of the major challenges is simply knowledge. People often think that the they don't understand their early care and education industry holistically. Even when you go to college, I have two degrees in early childhood education and my bachelor's and my master's. Um, and back then, uh, back in the 90s, <laughs> dating myself, right? But it's okay. I love it. Uh, we had one preschool education course. And some colleges even took out their preschool education course. So Sandy, people can, students can, college students can complete a credential in early childhood education and maybe have one course that's focused on the chakra industry on preschool. Think about that for a moment. So it's really important for our colleges to take a look at their curriculum and make sure that they're teaching industry-based curriculum. Same with the high schools, making sure you're teaching industry-based curriculum in your high schools and not just child development. That's only one component of it. It's only one of the uh, eight areas where they have to have training. Child development is one of those areas. So it's just make, you're making sure you have a holistic view and curriculum when it comes to our early care and education. Uh, so again, making sure you're working and it's industry-based. Everything is industry-based. So are you meeting with the people in your area? A major barrier with the knowledge component is people not knowing one another, Sandy. So I recall uh, some of the TA meetings calls I've had, and some are from several different, they're from the same state, I'll say, several different, several different people in the same state, but they're different TA calls. And I'll say, oh, you're in this state? Well, do you know this person? 
have you ever met with this person? And oftentimes they don't know one another. They don't know that program, industry, department, anything. So making those connections is so important for anyone who is interested in the early care and education industry to partner with others, to work along with others. Partnership is becoming a theme here, right? <laughs> uh, so reaching out. Everyone needs one another, just like you need students, because I hear people say we need students at the college level. Guess where they can come from? They can come from your local high school. Some people, uh, the child care industry, they need teachers. Guess where they can come from? Everyone's looking for the workforce to enhance the workforce. It is important to work together. So I would say take a look at who is implementing early childhood in your area locally, statewide as well, and start to get into those spaces together. Make sure that you're at the table at those meetings because so many meetings are happening, Sandy, especially with so much focus on early care and education nationally and in the budget, finally, yes, uh, with the different bills that have been proposed. We need to make sure that we are connecting with those in that area, and that will definitely take care of the barrier. So knowledge is the main one, Sandy, and I'm going to stop here because if we can pull those connections together and make sure that people understand their early care and education industry, not the school system, but early care and education preschool before they get to the school system, that's a great start to knock out the remaining uh, barriers. So instead of saying knowledge is a barrier, let me just say connections and maybe knowledge and connections, right? Making sure that you're connected in the community and talking with one another. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's so key. I think people will definitely take away knowledge and connections and partnerships from this because it overflows and intercedes with all of our questions really in some way or another. So to move on, in the webinars we've offered, you've mentioned the importance of an ECE advisory committee at the local high school and or school district level. Since we have a little bit of more time today, can you take some time to unpack this in a little more detail? So, oh, I'm so happy you asked this question, Sandy, because the advisory committee can be the key, the answer to your successful uh, early care and education program. So an advisory committee is not a board. You can call it that, but they're not ne necessarily making decisions for your program. They are the group who comes together a couple of times a year to support you with your curriculum, with your industry connections, your partnerships, your knowledge even, all of those barriers that we just discussed. They should consist of maybe, you know, you can decide five to seven people, but your local, a local child care center owner and director, you can have one or two, more than one. You can even have a local child care uh, a teacher on there if you want, maybe a pre-K teacher. Head Start even, uh, your more local business and in, in industry leaders. So they are family service workers. I remember having a family service worker on my committee when I was a high school CTE instructor. So let me tell you that makeup to give you some ideas. Uh, we had at least one local, uh, again, Chalker Center owner director where my students actually were able to go and do a lot of their work. Uh, we did have a family service worker. We had a professional development specialist from a local, a major child care uh, company. So that's how we got access to a lot of our professional development for free online as well. Uh, we even had a uh, professional who owned uh, health and industry. Uh, she was in the health industry. She had local gyms and fitness programs, but she helped us with our health and wellness component in our curriculum because physical development is a huge part of our curriculum. We had uh, someone who was also extremely important from the college. So one of the, I would say administrators, not top administrators though, but she actually supported the admissions of a local college. And she was on our advisory committee making sure that she made connections as well between us and the industry and, and the next level at the college level. So that those are just some examples. Again, five to seven people, you meet a couple of times per year. You let them look at your syllabi, your syllabus. So look at your syllabus and see, this is the syllabus that was passed down to me. Uh, I remember Sandy, when I was passed down the syllabus, uh, I was like, okay, this is what they were doing. Okay. If I wasn't from the early childhood industry, I would have thought, oh, I have it made. They gave me the syllabus. They gave me all the different assessments. I thought I had it. They would have thought they had it made, but I knew there had to be some tweaks to make sure it was industry-based. 
Okay, it's not just family consumer science, traditional family consumer science, but it's industry based early care and education. And uh, you will have someone from your the people who are on your advisory committee who can support your curriculum. So you guys, this is what was passed down uh, to teach the course. So this is what I'm currently teaching. And maybe that first meeting after you uh, do all in the introductions, it's about reviewing what you're doing and making uh, some recommendations for tweaking and improving your early care and education curriculum. So that's meeting number one. Make sure you feed them a little bit, you know, talk to your culinary arts department and ask if they're prepared some snacks for your for your meeting. Uh, second, the second meeting can be about reviewing um, any type of data that you collected for the year. And it can definitely be about the industry component of uh, the CDA credential. It could be about making sure they do have a place to go to do their observations and their the work with young children, the transportation component. So these are things that you can mention in the first meeting to let them know that this is what we're planning on doing for the year. This is how we'll communicate. And again, let them look at what you're currently doing. This is the, These are the textbooks that we're using. What are your recommendations? Uh, so again, five to seven people meet a couple of times per year, feed them, uh, but also listen. Very key, Sandy, that people listen. Because what I've noticed is sometimes we'll have those advisory committee meetings and we'll take it as a time to just show them what we're doing and we'll do most of the talking. In your advisory committee meeting, you, you want to do most of the listening because they will be the ones who are providing you industry-based information. So I hope that supports you. Uh, send them agenda ahead of time. Make sure you get some minutes out there. You can have an assistant principal, someone important also on your campus come in, your principal to greet them. But again, it's most important for you to provide listening time uh, on your committee meeting. Again, two meetings, but if you want to have three, have three. Uh, but most people will commit to two with no problem. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. And it's helpful too for the buy-in and for everyone involved in all of this to have a stake at the table. So those are fabulous tips. So thank you so much. Um, now in the handbook, you discuss how student organizations align with the CDA credential. What is a CTSO? And how can high, high school students simultaneous, simultaneously complete the requirements for both? CTSOs, you all may remember when you were in high school and you were a part of um, some student organizations, right? Well, CTSOs are career and technical student organizations. Uh, the two main organizations that the early child education students join are FCCLA and FFA. So in your area, you want to connect to your state level and your national FCCLA and FFA. And with FCLA and FFA, you may even end up being the advisor. So I remember partnering with our culinary arts instructor for FCCLA. And we were, he was advisor one year. I was advisor the next year, supported him. Uh, because oftentimes they will receive, the instructor receives a stipend in many uh, places for managing, uh, for being the advisor for their local CTSO. So with um, FCCLA or FFA, they have projects that they're required to do, and they're able to place locally in the state. Uh, they go to different, even nationally, they get to place in terms of the different projects that they do. So if they want to do the projects, they have to do those anyway, and you have portfolio requirements for your CDA anyway, you can match those up. And oftentimes the portfolio artifacts, the resource collection, some of those items can also serve as a project for FCCLA or FFA. We also have um, the community service hours. And I remember my students used to go to uh, events even on the weekend to support local organizations to get their community service hours. All of this, the community uh, volunteer service hours, but also the projects, when they get their certain number of points at the end of the year for their CTSO participation and completion, what they really want, what the high school students really, really want is those cords, those graduation cords. And they will do whatever they need to do to make sure they get a cord. So this is one of the ways they get to get their graduation cord. Uh, so I highly recommend, again, FCCLA, uh, FFA, 
in your program. You can even partner with your FBLA for your business program, uh, different CTSOs, TSA is for your technical student association. They're there as well. You can partner with your other CTSOs and they can do projects together. They can build a website with TSA. So FCLA or FFA can work with TSA. But again, all of it works together where they can put this in their portfolio. The T TSA students can even help them with their online portfolio for CDA. So again, there's so much I could say. They uh, In the professionalism department, I remember one of the major standards is professionalism for your CTSO. And so they're building a resume, their cover letter. And so we often work with FBLA on that because that's oftentimes what the business um, instructors are teaching. That's one of the, the, the units that they teach with FBLA. So partnering with other CTSOs, getting your community service hours, and also doing your projects. So not only are you competing, you're completing your portfolio and you're, uh, they're getting dual um, support, but also recognition and they deserve and enjoy the recognition. Yeah, no, that's so helpful. I mean, but again, this goes back to connections, connecting with others and, and their colleagues and, and other students and partnerships. It goes back to that same theme. And, and I mean, yeah, those are wonderful tips uh, for those to get involved in those organizations. Um, so since we don't have too much more time, before we wrap up today, we included a number of worksheets and checklists in the handbook to support assessing the need, getting started, in, and implementation of the high school CDA program. So what are some of your favorites and why? So many things that you asked for. So many things that the instructors ask for, they're in this handbook. And just in case you haven't made it all the way uh, to the towards the back of the handbook, let me tell you, these checklists will definitely save you a lot of time. Uh, one of the ones I love is a checklist that shows you what and when to order what and when to order, uh, when to order your different books, your CDA essentials book, when to order the, the CDA uh, standards guides, when to do what in terms of portfolio, when to take your CDA exam, just all of those wins. I get that a lot. And, and I share uh, one important fact here. You know, when students graduate, if they don't already have their CDA, it's really hard for them to get there to be still in the, for their visit in the summertime. So, and they travel, they have another job in the summertime. So I encourage the instructors by March of that year, it's so important for them to somehow be assessed around that time. Because in April, you have prom, you have graduation practice, they're trying to get ready for graduation. So if at all possible, it's so key that they earn their CDA around, again, March at the latest, Try not to apply later than March, but there's information in there to support them applying for their CDA. There's a checklist for the portfolio. So for the professional portfolio, um, we often get questions about how to write the competency statement. There are examples of how to write it. I often find that, you know, people, and even me, when I first started years ago, 20 years ago, uh, do, doing CDA training uh, as the instructor myself, I often thought the competency statement was almost a paper that was longer, that it was a long paragraph or a one pager. It's not. It is a simple statement about the students' practices with young children. So there are some competency statement examples in the handbook. Um, another one, of course, there's a checklist for the CDA professional portfolio, the, the resource collection component. I know you're wondering what exactly are they supposed to collect? Should they write them all? There's a checklist to support you. There's a checklist to support you in collecting and organizing your professional portfolio. And the last one I will share is the student organizations. There's even a document there that allows them to, there's a link to the council's uh, resource page where they have collected all, all the websites that are for uh, scholarships, but also for professional organizations, professional early childhood associations is what it, um, it was there. And so part of your portfolio is that the students have to, collect information on professional ECE organizations. So there's a checklist in there where they can, in the handbook, where they can write down their top three 
and they get to tell why, information about it, why, what's the website link. And all of this ends up transferring into the document that you would need for your portfolio. So everything in the handbook is purposeful, it's intentional, and they are there to support you in doing your work. They have a variety of budget sheets there too, Sandy, to support you in your budget, so you would know what you need. Another question I get, what do I need to ask for in terms of funding to make sure my students have the books that they need, the materials they need? There's There are a couple of budget worksheets there for you as well. So please take time to uh, go through the handbook and there are clickable links as well. I really know, I, I do know it's going to be great information for you. You don't have to read it from cover to cover because I know that's, you know, time's sake is hard to do. I highly recommend finding the section of where you are because when, in the handbook, we started with, uh, do you even do you even need a CDA program? And there's uh, some needs assessments, all of that there. If you're past that and you already have one, you can skip that chapter. OK, so go to the implementation chapter. That's where you are and check off what you've already done. Stop what, where you haven't done something and start with that particular checklist. Also, make sure you go all the way to the back to the appendix because there's additional information support there as well. Um, we love an acronym in early care and education. And so even when I said SCLA, you know, some people didn't know what SCLA was, FFA, they don't know what, what different terms are. The terminology, there is a terminology section in the back of the book to help you with all of these, uh, the information and links to additional pages for support. Thank you so much, Dr. Beza. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of acronyms, so that will be so helpful for, for folks to go to the back of the handbook to look that up, as well as the checklists and the worksheets. And I'm going to let our audience know, too, I mentioned it in the beginning, this handbook is free. Go to our website and um, you can download it for free, which is fabulous. And all those interactive worksheets are there. Um so any last thoughts, Dr. Biza, as we wrap up today? I know, are there any new projects or publications you're working on that like that you'd like to share with our audience today? Sure, Sandy. So I'll start with CDA things first because that's important, right? We were working on an implementation guide. And the implementation guide, instead of a, a large book, um, like the book that we have, the CDA handbook, it will be a much shorter book taking you straight to items to utilize in the program. And uh, one of the pieces that here lately that I've decided to add based on the last webinar we did is a syllabus. So I'm working on a sample syllabus that you'll be able to edit. We'll work with the tech team to get it all set up for you. But we want you to have a sample syllabus to get you started. Um, all of the components that are necessary for you to actually implement the city in the classroom, that's major. And then it's important to us. So we're working on those key pieces uh, in the implementation guide that will come out uh, in 2023. Uh, lastly, just personally, I'll share, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. So I have a couple of uh, a couple of children's books that came out this year. Uh, how Flowers Get Their Colors is my creative story about how flowers get their colors. And also there's a, a, a book and activity guide where uh, students can learn uh, counting and they can draw and write and also be creative. So those are just a couple of pieces that, I've, uh, that have come out. I'm always out there presenting and sharing. So if you're at a conference, just check the list, see if I'm there. Uh, and oftentimes if the council is there, sometimes I'm lurking around uh, in their exhibit booth because I really love the work that we're doing at the council and I love to support the workforce. So just a little bit about what I'm doing, Sandy. No, fabulous. And I know I've been at a lot of those conferences with you. So definitely everyone out there, if you know, we'll be um, somewhere near you, definitely come to our booth and look out for us. Um, so I think this ends our session for today, but I thank you, Dr. Biza, so, so much for your fabulous insights and to our audience for tuning in today. And again, uh, the council's website is www.cdacouncil.org. Thanks everyone.